This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cycling injuries. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, I work with a couple of cycling teams. Um, I work with Exergy Women's Professional Cycling Team, Exergy 2012, which is now Exergy 2016. Um, Team Mike's Bikes locally. Um, some other, I work with Dominican University. I've traveled with the ski team and uh, basketball team and worked at the Olympics and a whole bunch of um, different things like that. And so we're going to talk about some factors that lead to injury. Um, and then I'll go over some common injuries. Of course, there's many different injuries you can get from cycling, but we'll talk about a few common overuse injuries, a few common acute injuries, um, and then a little bit about how to prevent and treat them. So there's lots of factors associated with injury, as you've heard. Um, there's intrinsic factors related to you, the cyclist, and then there's extrinsic factors such as bad luck, bike fit, human error, rain, snow, cars, all kinds of things that we can't always control. Uh, intrinsic factors related to your technique, your what you come in with, your flexibility, your core strength, um, how you ride, how, how you train, um, how, how much you change that, and how much you, your body can tolerate what you're doing. Um, so just to start with a few acute injuries, most <laughs> one of the um, some common ones, concussions, um, clavicle fractures, shoulder separations, and then some contusions. So it's hard to talk about cycling without talking about concussions, um, at least from my perspective, because I see so many concussions in cyclists. Um, so concussion is a form of brain injury, and there's varying degrees of that, but it's basically an injury where the brain bangs around inside the skull. Um, so it's an acceleration, deceleration injury from a head hit, when the skull hits and stops or goes back and forth, and then the brain moves within the skull. And that affects the neurons in the brain. Um, typically with a concussion, there are no changes on imaging, so you don't see a bleed um, or anything on an MRI or a CT scan. So typically, you, if you go to the emergency room, you have those tests, you're sent home. So that's part of a concussion. Um, but then you get these symptoms that define concussion, and these symptoms can come right away, and they vary on, you know, from many different things, and they can come right away, or they can sort of evolve over days to weeks, and they can last for several weeks um, or even longer. So symptoms can, incur can include anything from loss of consciousness, which doesn't have to happen, to headaches, which are very common, nausea, vomiting, difficulty concentrating, loss of focus, um, uh, photosensitivity, sensitivity to bright lights or loud noises, um, um, having, having trouble thinking of multiple things at once, difficulty reading, blurry vision, there's all kinds of different symptoms of concussions. Um, and they're different in everybody and different in different um, populations. Um, one thing that's we worry a lot about are kids that get concussions and teenagers, and we see this a lot, I see this a lot now because California has a law that says kids with concussions have to be cleared by a physician before they're allowed to go back to sport. And so there's been a lot in the news about this and there's a lot more awareness, which is great. Um, but kids have different symptoms than adults. They, their symptoms can last longer because their brains are developing and they can be affected differently. Um, those that have had multiple concussions or brain injuries also have different symptoms. Sometimes there's a threshold, so the more times you hit your head, the easier it is to have symptoms, or the worse your symptoms can be, the longer they can last. There's all kinds of different factors, so we have to keep that in consideration when taking care of people with, with head injuries, because no two are the same. Um, it's very important to see a physician who's trained in concussion management 
for all these reasons and uh, for the reason that you don't want to risk going back to a contact sport such as cycling where you could have another hit <coughs> on top of the first hit or if you hadn't quite recovered while the brain is still susceptible and maybe not 100% if you, if you have another concussion or a hit it can cause worse symptoms or prolonged symptoms or, or um, even worse. Um, so we have specific return to play protocols that we vary by sport, by athlete, depending on the risk, depending on the person, and, and all the symptoms. So clavicle fractures, uh, very common. The clavicle acts as a strut for the shoulder girdle, and so it's very easy to fracture it if you fall directly onto the shoulder or onto the clavicle. When you're falling off your bike, one of the most common places you land, if you don't put your hand out, is your shoulder. So it's kind of a toss-up between your shoulder, your hand, or your hip. Depends where you, where you want to hurt yourself. Um, but often when falls happen really quickly, you don't have time to think, and, and your bike slides, you, you end up on your shoulder. Uh, so the most common location is mid-shaft in the clavicle, but you can also, we divide it into thirds. You can also fracture the distal third or the medial third. Those areas are a little less common, but they, they can happen. Typically, um, as, as you know, you have a painful swollen bump. Um, it's pretty sore right away. Occasionally the bone can even break through the skin, um, but usually it's quite sore. People hold their arms like this, they don't want to move, and they, they have swelling and bruising um, all around the area. You need an x-ray to diagnose it. Um, so typically people go to the hospital right away or later on that night because they have a lot of pain. So now we've seen another clavicle fracture. Um, there's all different degrees of clavicle fractures, and so if, they're, if it's just a small, frac a small amount of displacement, we tend to let those heal on their own. Um, but if there's an, any significant displacement, so more than about 100%, and shortening where the bone crosses over and the shoulder girdle gets a little bit, of, little bit shorter and compressed, those tend to do better with surgery. Um, 20 years ago, they didn't tend to fix any clavicle fractures. It, for the most part, they let them heal, and people would end up with some shoulder dysfunction and pain. Um, so these days, we're a lot more aggressive with fixing them, particularly in cyclists and triathletes and people who weight bear on their upper extremity. Um, so certainly, if there's shortening or displacement, um, or you're a weight-bearing athlete, or you use your arm for a lot of things, we tend to, to think about fixing them. They're treated with a little S-shaped plate and some screws. It's, it's fairly easy to do. It's right near the surface. Occasionally, that plate can cause people some trouble after if they wear backpacks or purses on it and irritates it, and that can be taken out later if needed. The beauty of surgery for clavicle fractures, you can get right back on your bike very quickly, um, so the recovery is a little bit shorter than if you don't have surgery. Um, that being said, there's risks with both. There's risk with surgery, so the indications have to be have to be right. Um, but typically we're finding m more now that the rates of non-union or malunion for a collarbone fracture are lower when they're treated surgically than they are if they're treated conservatively. Um, as I said, people tend to have shortening of that whole shoulder girdle and, and problems later if, if the if clavicle's not brought out to length and put in place. The clavicle heals pretty well. The bone your body forms a big callus around it, even when it's shortened and compressed, but it's later on that you can have some problems in the shoulder. Plus, it doesn't always heal there. Sometimes the, the, the fracture will continue to move and you'll get micro-movement and you'll have continued pain, and that's called a non-union. Um, TOS noted there is thoracic outlet syndrome, and that's a very rare complication where you get some nerve pain after a, a collarbone fracture. Um, so another common acute injury is a shoulder separation or an acromioclavicular joint sprain. The acromioclavicular joint is the joint at the end and the top of the shoulder between the clavicle, the front collarbone, and the scapula. And it's held together by ligaments, similar to your ankle. It's a common hockey injury when they hit the boards. So anytime you hit the end of the shoulder, it can cause the ligaments to sprain and the shoulder tense up very common. You've probably seen someone at some point in your life with a little bump on their shoulder. And when it happens, the shoulder pops up, the ligaments get injured, and they don't really ever come back down. So the ligaments stay sort of stretched out, and they heal, and they stop hurting, but you tend to be left with a bump. Um, now, the key with these is they, 
the way we really diagnose them is holding some weights. So we have you hold weights in both hands and we take an x-ray. They never do this in the emergency room. Just last week I had someone come in with an x-ray from uh, Marin General. He was a cyclist, had fallen, was told he had a grade two separation. So grade one, nothing really changes. Grade two, it moves a little bit. Grade three is around 100% um, separation. And so he said, oh, I think I have a grade two separation. I said, well, let's, let's do another x-ray and give you some weights. And sure enough, it went way higher. It was a grade three. Grade three is kind of borderline on whether you treat it conservatively or surgically. Um, so if you have an AC separation, you need to have an x-ray with weights just to really truly diagnose this and see what the difference is. There's grades one to six, so grades four, five, and six are more complicated. It pops up, it goes forwards, it goes backwards. There's all kinds of different problems. Those last three tend to require surgery. Grade three is sort of borderline. We tend to not do surgery on grade threes. Depends on the demands and the person. Um, and these tend to heal very well. We just protect your range of motion. Sometimes we'll do physical therapy to regain your strength and your scapular stability. Um, Pain is your guide, and, and as it gets better, you can get moving and doing other things. Um, you can ride right away on a trainer with this, and um, they, they, they do well. Contusions, very common in cycling as well. Of course, everybody who's fallen knows that very well. Um, as I mentioned, common places to fall, the hip, the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist. Um, one place we sort of are a little more careful of is the side of the hip. You may have also seen people with what looks like a goose egg on the side of their hip sticking out of their cycling shorts. And um, that's common. So that's a bursitis often when you fall in the area. There's a little sack of fluid that's a cushion that can blow up like a balloon. And, and it can stay blown up for quite a while. Um, sometimes I drain these, sometimes I don't. Um, with the lateral hip there, the bursa is over the joint. So we are a little more careful with those. Um, because if they happen to get infected, there can occasionally be communication so with the joint. So if you, if you ever see any signs of infection over a contusion or somewhere you've hit, heat, swelling, excessive pain, um, fevers or chills, then you definitely need to see a doctor. Um, I have a pretty low tolerance for giving antibiotics if there's bad road rash, especially if it's over the bursa or somewhere like that, um, just because you want to prevent infection. Um, also really important to clean the road rash and ice the area and it just they get inflamed they get sore you get fluid and it all calms down eventually but they can look really nasty when when you first have them okay so that's about it for acute injuries there's many more but those are some common ones now we'll talk about overuse injuries and these are very common in cycling very much related to bike fit to training load training errors um, intrinsic factors flexibility other sports other sports that you do that you may take injuries into cycling um, or previous injuries or arthritis in different places that can all be felt uh, come out as pain on the bike so the knee is a very common place for cyclists and other people to get injured um, we try to localize where the pain is, um, front, side, back, inside, outside, does it move? Um, the knee is also a common spot to have referred pain from the back or from the hip. Hip arthritis often refers to the knee. I've had countless patients come in and say, I hurt my knee, and I tell them they have a disc bulge in their back and they don't believe me. <laughs> or they have hip arthritis and they feel it in their knee. Young kids can sometimes have developmental hip problems and they come in limping with knee pain. So it's a spot that, that transmits pain back and forth and can have its own problems as well. Um, previous surgeries, other problems, other um, injuries can impact what injury you'll find in the knee. So one of the most common knee problems, the bread and butter of sports medicine it's, is called is, uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome, also called runner's knee, anterior knee pain. It has a whole bunch of different names. It's a very common complaint in sports medicine. And it's defined as maltracking of the kneecap or the patella, and then you get irritation of the cartilage underneath. Um, so you can see on one of these pictures, the patella, if you look at it from um, the end, has a point or a triangle underneath it, and it, it moves in a groove in the femur. The groove is called the trochlea. And there's cartilage that lines each joint. Thank you. So each part of that, each bone is lined by cartilage. Thanks. So here, you can see that there's a groove that the patella tracks in. And what you don't see on this picture is a thin layer of cartilage, the way the paint lines the plaster on the wall, and that lines the bones. 
And so if the kneecap isn't tracking smoothly up and down, if it's banging around in that groove, it's going to irritate the cartilage. If that continues, that becomes arthritis. Arthritis is wearing of cartilage. Um, so that's patellofemoral pain in a, you know, in a general sense, that maltracking of the kneecap. Um, there are many factors that contribute to this. Genetics are a big one. I always look at everybody. Some people are born with their kneecaps facing each other instead of facing straight ahead. Pronation of the foot, that's a big one. That makes your knees fall in. Weak glutes or weak hips, that causes the knee to go in. Um, if your feet turn out, so dancers get this problem as well. If they're growing and they force their turnout, their knees go in. Um, previous surgeries, tight IT bands, all kinds of different things, age. Um, and then core fatigue, as we talked about, changes your cycling mechanics, which can change the way your knee moves. Typically, at the end of a long ride, you'll often see people with their knees kind of going in more than it normally would. And depending on the float and their pedals that can, and their tolerance for that, that can irritate their kneecap. So this is just a picture that kind of summarizes some of that. The, the glute strength, so if your glute is weak, your knee goes in instead of tracking straight. Glute strength keeps your knee going straight up and down, and that even happens when you're going up and down stairs. So a lot of people with sore knees, if they'll look down, they'll see their knee is going in when they go down the stairs. If you test their glute or their hip abductor strength, usually you can break them pretty easily. They're usually weak on that side. Um, Decreased strength of the thigh muscles, so we talk about the VMO or the vastus medialis, which is the inner thigh that attaches to the inside of your kneecap. That helps pull that kneecap flat. If your IT band is tight, it will tip it to the outside, and so the VMO helps pull it flat and keep it even in the groove. So it's a balance between keeping the VMO strong, the IT band loose, and the glutes tight so it moves straight, and keeping the feet neutral, because if your foot moves, that also causes the knee to go in. And then there's some various um, treatments for that. Major, the main treatment is looking at the mechanics and strengthening and fixing the problem. I had a pro cyclist come in last week and with this problem, and sure enough, I test his glutes. Super weak on one side. Um, just very, very common. And sometimes that, that's sort of the chicken and the egg thing. Any injury on the lower leg or chain, the ankle, the knee, you test their, test their hip strength, they tend to be weak. So sometimes I think that comes, if you get injured, then you favor it, you get weak, and you can also get injuries from being weak in that spot. So the treatment for this problem, so it's interesting because in sports other than cycling, I usually give cycling as a treatment um, because that motion is very helpful. It's true. So it's a little more tricky when a cyclist comes in with this problem. It's very common in runners, so I tell them to cycle. Um, and usually cycling doesn't hurt their knee when this is the problem from other things. But if you get a cyclist where they get patellofemoral pain purely from cycling, there's usually a problem with the bike fit and a training error. So number one, you have to assess the bike fit. Um, number two, you've got to back them off look at their training, what they've been doing, back off their activity, and see if you can get them just doing some easy spinning um, where it doesn't hurt. Then you have to cross-train them, get them to physical therapy, get them in the gym, strengthen their core, strengthen their VMOs, get their function and their coordination working properly, um, and then they can go back on the bike and their knee will slowly get better. Um, but the key to fix this is getting them off the bike and doing other things, which is sometimes difficult. Um, but you can't just cycle, you have to correct the problem somewhere else. Uh, so another common knee pain, uh, knee problem is IT band friction syndrome. It's the most common cause of lateral or outside knee pain. It's common in sports with repetitive flexion and extension like cycling and running. Um, at 30 degrees of knee flexion, which we know is just about when the leg is straight down at the bottom, there's a lot of tension between the IT band, which is the muscle that comes down on the outside of the leg, and the femoral condyle, which is the uh, bone, the femur, at the top of the knee. And that's the widest part of that bone where the, knee, the IT band comes. And so you can develop friction in there. Um, again, causes of that are often glute weakness, and particularly in runners when their hips start tilting, but also in cycling or foot pronation, things that change the mechanics and put more stress on the IT band, and it puts it more under tension down at the bursa. So we have to modify the activity, often anti-inflammatories, ice massage in the area, um, physical therapy, working on the IT band 
flexibility, loosening it up, and then strengthening the core and the glutes, and again, correcting those biomechanical problems. The key with overuse injuries is figuring out what the problem was and fixing it, or it's just going to keep coming back. Uh, so another common overuse injury is patellar or quad quadriceps tendinopathies, tendinosis. In the old days, you used to call it tendinitis. Um, now we know that it's, uh, we call it more of a tendinopathy. It's a micro tear in the tendon. So you get little micro tears in the tendon, and then tendons don't have the greatest blood supply in general, so they tend to heal with a bit of junky scar tissue before you get good tendon fibers. That junky scar tissue is a little weak spot, so when you go out and do what you were doing before that caused the same activity that caused the injury, that tendon junk tends to rip again, and you get micro tears again. So it just becomes a little bit of a vicious cycle and you get some discoloration or some scar tissue that forms in the tendon. So it's very hard to replace that with good quality tendon fibers. Um, you can have pain in that process as the body tries to revascularize and replace that tendonopathy or scar tissue in the tendon with good quality fib tendon fibers. Occasionally that can lead to tearing, so it becomes a weak spot in the tendon and you can actually have a macro tear or a tear that you can see in the tendon. So, Patellar tendonitis or tendinopathy is underneath the kneecap, going from where the kneecap, um, between the kneecap and the tibia. So the quadriceps tendon comes down here, this is an MRI, and the tendon is black. This is the patella or the kneecap. And this is some chunky stuff in the tendon down there. You can also get quadriceps tendinopathy up here, or even tearing. The one down here is typically called jumper's knee. It's very common in basketball and jumping sports where there's a lot of hard impact, eccentric activity. Um, in cycling, I don't see the tears as much. You see them more commonly in, in the uh, running and jumping sports, but you see the tendinopathies a lot, um, often related to you know too much too soon, pushing hard gears, um, and and. It is a little tricky to get rid of this. There's different modalities we use, eccentric strengthening where you're doing quick drops and slow ups. That's one way to help that tendon repair itself with good quality tendon fibers. Um, deep tissue massage, acupuncture, needling, anything that stimulates the blood flow in that tendon helps slowly over time re um, uh, repair the tendon with good quality tendon. Bike fit's important, modifying activity. Again, get them off the bike and train them, and then you can work better on the bike. Not mentioned here, but another, another injury I often see in cyclists is VMO strains, or strain of, of the quad on the inside, and that's also from pushing heavy gears. I often see it in track cyclists because they start from such a stop and then have to push so hard. Um, and those heal a lot, little, lot more easily than the tendinopathies because it's in the muscle where there's better blood supply. So neck and back pain. Um, Curtis touched on this. It's very common in cycling. Um, there was a sur survey done, a male survey, where they um, surveyed about 500, 600 recreational cyclists. 85% um, of these people reported having at least one injury for which they sought medical attention. Number one was neck pain. 48% had neck pain. Number two was the knee, and then close to that was low back pain. 30% reported low back pain. They found that female cyclists reported um, one to two times, one and a half to two times more uh, neck and shoulder pain than the men did. You could hypothesize that's because women are typically weaker in their upper bodies than men, and so depending on the stability, you may have more neck pain. Uh, so low back pain. Low back pain has many things that can, there are many things it can be. So the differential diagnosis, we call it, what could it be, is there's a long list in the back. Um, muscle strain is common. If you pick something up or you overdo it, you can strain the muscles. What I call mechanical low back pain related to your core weakness, your pelvic instability, and some tightening of the muscles and dysfunction in the way that you move. Uh, facet syndrome, when the little facet joints in the spine get inflamed. Sacroiliac SI joint dysfunction. You can herniate a disc. You can have um, overuse injuries in the disc. You can have degenerative changes and bulging in the discs. Um, back pain is common on and off the bike. 
Um, back pain is very common after doing too much too soon on the bike. You sort of hit that threshold where you feel strong, you feel great, and it's a nice day, and everyone's going to point raise, and everybody's racing, and you should turn around, but you just keep going, and you feel great when you're going, and then you get home, and <laughs> you can't move the next day. Your back's seized up, and that lasts for a month or so. And so next time, you don't go all the way to point raise. You have to go a little little less far but it's it's easier said than done but that's where people feel it in their backs commonly on the bike especially if you don't have a great bike fit if you're a little weaker in your core early in the season you're not as strong you're not used to being in that position and keeping your mechanics and your core engaged to facilitate um, the technique uh, again you can't just bike. If you want to keep your back healthy and your knees healthy, you've got to do other stuff. You've got to cross train, you've got to do lateral motion, you've got to do core work, Pilates, yoga, whatever it is, but you can't just bike or your body will, will pay for it. Um, so contributing factors, as I mentioned, too much too soon, especially hills or the long rides early in the season. Um, if your pelvis is out of alignment, so your legs, your pelvis can be rotated and legs can look longer or shorter and that then if that's not accommodated for in your, in your fit or if you're weak, that can lead to back pain, um, core and glute weakness, um, incorrect pelvis position, depending on your bike fit, your flexibility and your strength, stiff hamstrings, or if your mid back's particularly stiff, that puts more stress on your lower back. If your quads and hip flexors are tight, that pulls you more rounded, which puts more stress on your lower back. If you don't do anything else other than cycle and sit at a desk, <laughs> it all adds up. Um, so again, the treatment for back pain is uh, modifying your cycling, maybe get on a trainer and sit upright if your back is really sore, do lighter, easier rides, uh, looking at your technique and physical therapy, strengthening your core, stretching out your hamstrings, your IT bands, quads, deep tissue work, um, fitting your bike, changing your, your training patterns, and then slowly building back up as you get stronger and you can handle it. Um, neck pain, also very common due to the position in cycling where your neck is extended and your back is flexed. Um, improper bike fit is a huge contributor here, especially if there's too much weight on your hands. We talked about having, you know, light weight in your hands you should just transmit the force to your thorax. But if your fit is such that you're tilted forward and there's all the weight on your hands, it's very hard to be sort of light and stable and stable. Um, you get a lot more force on your neck and tend to be sort of like this. So it's very important to have a bike fit where you're, you're strong through your lats and the force is just transmitted here. You're not all the weight on your hands. Um, again, just riding long distances in that position just makes a lot of people's neck sore, particularly if you have a little bit of arthritis in there, a bit of degenerative changes, if you've had car accidents in the past, neck pain is common, um, and certainly getting on a bike for five hours, you're going to feel whatever you've got going in there. So, you know, that position just leads to that. And core weakness and, st and core um, weakness in your scapular stabilizers and your thorax, again, can contribute to more instability in the neck and more forces being transmitted to the neck. Um, Treatment for this, slower increase in miles, the rule of thumb is always sort of 10%. Increase in time and distance is a safe and healthy way to do it, which we don't all do. Um, trying to relax your upper body, keeping strong through your core and your lats. And you can actually, you know, change positions, stretch your neck out, do things like that while you're on, on a long ride. Change your hand positions around. Um, try to keep your core engaged and uh, work on strengthening your, your neck stabilizers and your scapular stabilizers. That can all help. Uh, so, in conclusion, overuse injuries are common, often related to bike fit. Acute injuries are very common, often related to bad luck, bad conditions, <laughs> cars that get in the way. Um, so you want to address mainly the overuse injuries with cross training, core strengthening, stretching, flexibility, getting a good bike fit, and <laughs> don't fall off your bike. <laughs>